Loki, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I want to start with someone that I, I couldn't bring myself to talk about in my uh, opening. Sir Keir Starmer, KC, the leader of Her Majesty's opposition in Parliament, went on a British radio station this morning and said that Israel has the right to cut off water and electricity from the people in Gaza, acts with which Mrs. von der Leyen described as acts of pure terror last year, and acts which are explicitly forbidden in international law and the laws of war. How did we reach such a stage? Your views? Well, it, se it seems, George, and thank you for having me, that Keir Starmer is actually more pro-Israel than Philadelphia's favorite son, Benjamin Netanyahu. Let's not forget that what you have just described are forms of collective punishment, which is a war crime according to the Geneva Conventions. And Keir Starmer is supposedly a human rights lawyer who should know that. But instead, Keir Starmer is somebody that for a long time has cavorted with the Israel lobby in this country and done its bidding to the nth degree. We cannot forget that one of the key funders of Keir Starmer has been Trevor Chin. Trevor Chin is a key figure in the Israel lobby and a former director of BICOM, which is the Israel lobby group that through its We Believe in Israel project, led by Luke Akehurst, who's on the Labour Party's NEC, sought to have my music removed from Spotify. But I'll tell you something about Keir Starmer, George, that maybe the viewers may not know. That despite his servility to the Israel lobby, even within his own constituency, Israel is so unpopular that the headquarters of Elbit Systems Israel's largest arms company was driven out of the constituency by Palestine Action, the direct action organization that has taken to shutting down Israeli arms factories in this country. So even in the constituency of Keir Starmer, Elbit Systems was driven out. So despite his best efforts to prostitute himself to the Israel lobby, it does not seem like it is getting across to the public. That sentiment is not shared by the masses. Uh, he doesn't really mean it, Loki. Uh, if he did, it wouldn't make it any better, but I can tell you he doesn't really mean it. I was at a meeting against Israel's aggression that he addressed in 2015. I've also seen the video of a meeting he addressed calling on the football authorities to kick Israel out of FIFA. The truth is this wow. man is just a rancid, rancid, lying opportunist. That's all. Don't know if that makes it any better or even worse. What do you think? Well, I believe it. I mean, we also know that prior to that period of time that you're talking about, he was the director of public prosecutions. Now, during that time, the only foreign state attorney that he met with and accepted gifts and hospitality from was Moshe Lador, who was the state attorney of Israel. And not long after that, he made the decision to block the prosecution of Sipi Livni, somebody that myself and yourself have stood on platforms protesting against and denounced from those platforms when there were arrest warrants actually put out for her in this country by judges. He, as director of public prosecution, uh, blocked that prosecution. We also won't forget that during the protests against Operation Castled, where we saw many young North African and Middle Eastern youth criminalized after they were beaten by police outside the Israeli embassy 2008-2009. It was Keir Starmer, who was director of public prosecution at the time 
when a lot of those young men ended up serving years in prison. So I believe you, but I also believe that he may be the type of person who does not have any solid convictions and blows with the wind when it serves his interests. Well, speaking of blowing with the wind, uh, the first time I ever came across white phosphorus, I was in Beirut in 1982 when Israel invaded Lebanon in what they called Operation Grapes of Wrath. And the Times, as was then, had the peerless Robert Fisk as their correspondent on the front line, how times have changed. And Robert Fisk wrote a piece about the effect of white phosphorus. He talked of being in the hospital wards in Beirut, where children had smoke coming out of their mouths and nose because they had ingested this white phosphorus gas, which then proceeded, as he put it, to literally cook them from the inside and nothing could be done to help them. They burned to death from the inside, from the white phosphorus, which is now a war crime, officially, to use against civilian targets. But Israel is now not only using white phosphorus in Gaza, it was using it again in Lebanon yesterday. And I haven't seen that even reported anywhere. Your thoughts? Well, let's be clear. Um, the United States also used white phosphorus in Fallujah. Um, and we saw that along with the use of depleted uranium being uh, blamed by many for the increase to an exponential level of the amount of cancers that are in the area of Fallujah. Now, part of the reason that Israel is able to do this is those weapons often come from the United States, but the funding to buy the weapons comes from the United States. And we're not just speaking in sentimental language when we say that. The United States literally gives $10.4 million a day, $430,000 an hour, $7,229 a minute, and $120 a second of US taxpayers' money, supposedly, to racist Israeli apartheid in Palestine. And I'll tell you, US politicians, when you consider that equation, are fairly cheap. Because in 2020, uh, pro-Israel lobby groups only spent about $33 million um, on funding members of US uh, Congress. And you'll be interested to know that uh, the Democrats almost got double the amount that the Republicans got from the Israel lobby at that time. And we remember in 2021, after uh, Ma'arakat Saif al-Quds, the, the, the battle of the unity and tafada as it was known, you saw US Congress vote immediately to give another billion dollars on top of all of that to Israel, which was then given directly to the US arms company Raytheon and the Israeli arms company Raphael to replenish the Iron Dome system. So this is what we are talking about. And it was interesting, George, that you mentioned earlier NATO's involvement. And in many ways, Ukraine and Palestine are now front lines of NATO's war against the global south. But Israel is believed to have carried out assassinations in at least 18 other sovereign states, from Italy to France to Cyprus to Greece to Norway to Germany, to the UAE, to Egypt, to Jordan, to Uruguay, Lebanon, Brazil, Tunisia, Belgium, Malta, Malaysia, Syria, Iran. Several of these states are NATO nations, but yet they do not believe in their own sovereignty to the extent that they would back Israel in the way they would do, despite the fact that Israel is believed to have carried out assassinations on their soil. You're a Rolls Royce uh, of a young man. I'm sure everyone else that's watching is thinking that too. Uh, sorry to raise this. Uh, 
I was looking at uh, a video just minutes ago before the show started of us uh, on the march uh, with the lovely Annie Lennox and other people from the music industry marching uh, against the, I uh, think, 2008 war, but it may have been one of the interminable others. But the music industry today was summed up by Justin Bieber, who, thanks to you, I know, put out a tweet with a picture of the destroyed Gaza with the words, I stand with Israel on it. He thought the picture was Israel, but was in fact the handiwork of Israel in Gaza. What's happened to the music industry, the cultural milieu? Because from what I can see, even the right wing, so-called right wing populists demanding freedom of speech and freedom not to wear a mask and all of that, they have all fallen in behind the drums of war and genocide. What's happened, Loki? Well, when it comes to the music industry, you may be interested to know that some of the most interesting and politically challenging music historically was released on Universal Music Group. So, for instance, Reggae for Peach, the song for Blair Peach that was released, came out on who was killed by the police um, uh, in the 80s, if I remember correctly, um, or maybe the late 70s. This was released on Universal. 70s, yeah. But the 70s. But today, Universal is headed by a gentleman by the name of Lucian Grange. Now, Lucian Grange attended a fundraiser for the IDF in 2016. His wife is also a key donor to the Conservative Party and to the Zionist Federation. On top of that, you now have a director of Universal Music Group by the name of Haim Saban, who is one of the largest fundraisers for the Israeli military in its history. And he's credited with scripting uh, Joe Biden's Palestine uh, policy. On top of that, you have another Israel lobby group within the music industry called the Creative Community for Peace, which is the same organization as Stand With Us. It's headed by someone called Dave Renza, who also came out of Universal Music Group. So just to make clear how powerful Universal is, we're talking about the Beatles, we're talking about Michael Jackson, we're talking about Bob Marley, we're talking about some of the biggest artists that have ever existed assigned to a label which at least for the last 10 years has um, pro-Israel figures at the helm. And we can also say that Lucy and Grange, he's recently been put on the board of trade by the Conservative government. He was a regular guest to David Cameron at Checkers. Um, and Lucy and Grange has so much power in the music industry that in 2019, he earned in bonuses in one year as much money as all UK songwriters made off of streams in one year. This is the CEO of Universal music. So essentially the same dynamics which domina dominate uh, the media industry also uh, dominate the music industry. So I think that discourages artists to really study these uh, issues in depth and definitely steers them away from uh, supporting the Palestinians in the way that uh, maybe Annie Lennox and others did previously.